Teresa Tato, also from Michigan State University. So they'll just follow one after the other. Um, so I'm Raven McClory, and I'm in the Department of Teacher Education at Michigan State University. And um, I want to thank everybody for inviting me to speak here, and thank the NSF for funding the project that I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to explain some of the results of a project that I've been working on for a few years that's studying, the, um, studying undergraduate mathematics courses required for elementary teacher certification. Um, and I probably don't need to talk about why this is important because I'm probably preaching to the choir. Oh, back up. I've got the definitive answer. What matters from Bill? Nothing matters. <laughs> so I can probably sit down and shut up, but I won't. <laughs> So um, I probably don't need to talk about this, but I got interested in these courses because of my frustration with the problem of scale. Uh, um, you know, there are a lot of really good ideas about how to teach teachers mathematics that they need for teaching, but the scaling problem is enormous. And in fact, these courses are courses that almost every teacher who is certified in the United States takes. Um, most teachers are still certified through traditional routes. Alternative routes are growing, but most teachers are still certified through traditional routes, and they all take at least one math course for teachers, as far as I can tell. Um, so the scale problem and then the responsibility, they're almost always taught in mathematics departments. And so that means that mathematicians and mathematics departments have a great deal of control over what happens in these classes, which I think gives us the potential, gives them the potential to have great leverage on what um, elementary teachers learn before they become teachers, what mathematics they learn. Raven, does that no mean? Not taught by mathematicians, right. They're all, the math. They're all in the math department, but some of them aren't taught by mathematicians. I'll get to some of that data in a moment. Um, so these two things, the scale and the responsibility, made me think that it would be important to understand what happens in these classes. And there is surprisingly little almost no research about mathematics courses required for elementary certification. CBMS does a survey every five years that has a, about that much data about these courses. And other than that, there's been very little work um, to even describe the courses, much less understand differences and effects. Um, my goal here, I'm going to describe some of the things that I've learned about the courses, but not even close to everything. There's much that I'm going to leave out, so I'm just going to touch on it, and if you have specific questions, we collected a ton of data. So. And then I'm going to explain our model of the student's achievement. And in this talk, student is always going to mean undergraduate pre-service teacher. Um, so I'm going to explain our model of their achievement, trying to understand what accounts for differences in achievement. And the good news, to give you the punchline, at least part of the punchline, is that when students take these classes, they learn mathematics that's important for teaching. And they learn a lot of mathematics that's important for teaching. That's what our data is saying. Um, so our sample, we have 57 institutions in the sample from three um, locations, uh, Michigan, New York City, and South Carolina. And actually, we added a fourth location, one school in a fourth location at a late date. So we have 57 schools, which was 81% of the ones that we tried to enlist. We didn't enlist schools for two reasons. One, we had a few that declined. But mainly, we had IRB issues that we could not resolve. So we, we were unable to enlist certain schools, which was very infuriating. Uh, the schools are fairly, a fairly typical mixture of schools in size, diversity, public, private, size of the cohort. Um, you know, there, it's a great mixture of schools. We, we tried to enlist every school in these three locations succeeded greatly in Michigan and South Carolina and to a much lesser extent in New York City. So we have historically black schools, private schools, public schools, religious schools, large, small, everything. Um, in our data, as in the CBMS data, the average number of courses required for elementary teachers is two math courses. That is two beyond any um, prerequisite requirement. So two courses beyond some general prerequisite if there is one. Um, if there's a specialization, the average in my, in my data, and it's close to the same in the CBMS data, is seven. A specialization means, generally means you're certified to teach middle school math. Many, many states, we're, we're probably approaching most states now, are requiring a different certification for middle school teaching. You have to have a specialization. If, you, if you're elementary certified, you have to have a specialization. You could also be secondary certified and teach middle school. But if there's an elementary specialization requirement, the average is seven courses. 
Now note, two is one fewer than what the CBMS recommended in the 2001 document, the mathematical education of teachers. Seven is two fewer than the nine that were recommended in that same document. So these numbers have been increasing, have increased a lot since 2000, but they're still not at the level that CBMS recommended 11, 10 or 11 years ago. Um, the number required varies by type of school, by size, by selectivity of the school. There's all kinds of variation in these numbers. Some only require one. We had one school that requires no math courses for elementary teachers. Um, what about the inside of the courses? Most of the courses, 80%, are courses specifically designed for elementary teachers. The other 20% are courses that are in the general math curriculum. Uh, they might be called general math or math for liberal arts, or it might be any course above X level. So in 20% of the cases, they are not courses required for elementary, I mean, designed for elementary teachers. Um, in those that are designed for elementary teachers, Half of them have as their primary focus number and operations. Um, because in some cases there's only one course required, the primary focus is not number and operations. It's a little of this, a little of this, you know. Um, so there were other foci that were mentioned, but 50% of the courses really are about number and operations. Um, there are 13 textbooks written for these courses in print as of a couple of years ago and when I took up these data. And 60% of these courses use one of those textbooks in our sample. Um, the other courses use a variety of things. Many of them use self-created materials. Some of them use a collection of books um, written for about elementary mathematics, but not specifically textbooks. And some of them use pulled together materials from other sources. Um, but one of the things to note in a conference that's talking about standards there are no standards for these courses or textbooks. And what we saw is um, at least two types of textbooks that I can describe. I'm not going to talk, we did a major study of these textbooks, but I'm not going to talk about that except to say, if you wanted to categorize them simply, there are two types. One is an encyclopedia that includes everything there is that an elementary teacher could possibly want to know, topics, representations, manipulatives, you know, whatever. And the other is a much more focused course that covers things but has a math takes a mathematical point of view and would be a, a book that you could teach a course from. These encyclopedic books, you would have to create a course using the book. The other kind of book you could teach a course from. Sibylla's book is one of the other kind, the point of view kind, and Tom Parker's book. Those are the, really the only two that were that type. Um, instructors, we had 77 instructors total in our sample. That was um, not a good turnout from the possibilities. That was about half of the instructors that we elicited a data from. But they were all in math departments. In fact, all the instructors, even those who didn't answer, were in math departments. 57% um, were in tenure stream. And as you can see from the graph, their highest degree varied considerably. That We had math ed PhDs, we had math PhDs, we had math masters, we had math ed, ed masters, and then we had a collection of others that included PhD in some other subject like physics, um, bachelor's degree only, highest degree was bachelor's degree, a few of, two of those, I think. So it varied a lot, and the tenure stream being only 57%, there were a couple of things there. We had a lot of um, adjunct, part-time professors, I mean, instructors, uh, many of whom were former teachers. And we had um, a few graduate students, not very many in this sample, I think we had eight graduates, no, fewer than that, six graduate students total in the sample. But everyone was in a math department. Um, the instructors, surprisingly, 64% had um, K-12 teaching experience. Of course, a lot of the adjuncts did, and many of the graduate students did. Uh, many of them have taught calculus, 69%, 94% have taken calculus. Their experience teaching this course, I report the median of two, the mean was 16, but we had one person who had taught it 50 times, so it kind of skewed. There were a couple like that, you know, that had taught that course for their whole career t two or four times a year. So um, that kind of skewed it. We, we did a measure of their interest in teaching the course, and that was not particular. they were not particularly enthusiastic. We asked them if they were interested in teaching it right now while they were teaching it, and we asked them if they were interested in teaching it again in the future. And on both scales, it came in relatively low on a scale of zero to three. So, um, you know, 
They're not excited. Most of them aren't excited about it. Now, some were very excited. But Now, I want to turn attention to, that's all I'm going to say about these detailed data about the courses. There's much more to say, but I'll leave it at that since time is limited, and talk about learning in these courses. So what, what we wanted to know is, what did the undergraduate students learn in these math courses for certification? Um, we designed a pretest, post-test study. We had two forms of the test, and we alternated so that about half the students took form A and then form B, and half the students vice versa. These are items. We built the test from items that we got from the Learning Mathematics for Teaching Project at Michigan, University of Michigan. If you're not familiar with that, Heather Hill and Deborah Ball have had this project for many years in which they developed items to measure teacher knowledge. And they piloted and validated them and provide data about them. Um, so we selected items that focused on number and operations with a more specific focus on fractions. These are um, item response theory um, scored, which means the, the test is not scored on a percent correct basis. Each item is scored based on its difficulty for the population. So the scores are not typical percent correct scores. And we normed ours so that the mean was 50 and the standard deviation was 10. Um, in our sample, we had over 1,000 matched pre and post tests from 40 instructors. In this smaller sample, every instructor that we invited to participate did participate. We had one drop out after the pretest. But we ended up with 40 instructors, and they were from about 25 schools. So here's a picture of what happened. This is a gain across instructor. So we had gains all the way from a half a point to over 16 points. Remember, the mean is 50, and the standard deviation is 10. So these are huge effect sizes. The, the point gain is the effect size, essentially. So these are enormous effect sizes, but you can see there's a huge amount of variation. And these little numbers on the bottom, this is their relative ranking on the pretest. So that person there was the highest scorer on the pretest and also one of the highest gain. We thought there might be a ceiling effect, but there didn't seem to be. And this number 40 was the lowest scorer on the pretest and had a gain of about three points. So that's an effect size of 0.3, which is a a big effect size for, even for the people on the low end, that's a big effect size for education research. So that's why I'm saying that students are learning from these courses. They're, and the LMT items measure math that has been correlated with student, children's achievement. In a study that Heather did some years ago, they assessed um, teachers using these LMT items and had the scores of their children on standardized tests and found that the, the um, LMT item scores correlated with the children's scores. So the higher the teacher did on the LMT items, the higher you would predict the students would do on their national achievement test. So this is the basis for my saying that these courses are important and that students learn from them. They're learning stuff that is important. Uh, here's another view of the variation, the scatter chart with the pretest on the bottom and the post-test on the y-axis and the regression line in the middle. And you can see there's a huge amount of variation across instructors. So we were interested in um, understanding how do we explain that variation across instructors. There's obviously a huge amount of variation in students, too. But we want to explain it. What is it that instructors are doing that works? What matters in these classes? So here's our question. Can we explain differences in student achievement across instructor based on characteristics of students instructors, and classroom context. And it's a nested model, a typical hierarchical model with students at the lower level, classes, and then institutions. We don't have enough institution, different institutions. We only have 25 and not enough instructors in each institution to actually treat that as statistically as a different level. So we put that in, those characteristics in at level two at the instructor level. But I want to ask you, if you were going to do this study, what characteristics of students would you use as possible predictors of their own individual achievement? Past achievement. What? Past achievement. Past achievement, okay. That's one. What else? Curiosity. Hard to measure, but yes, curiosity. How many hours a week they have to work for money? 
Oh, how many hours a week? That's a new one. Nobody's mentioned that one before. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? Other math courses, yep, they've taken, and, and the highest one. How many and what were they? What else might matter? Attitude, age, attitude. Okay, anything else? So here are the ones that I want to mention. We didn't measure curiosity. We did measure attitude. We measured all the other things you've mentioned. And measure, we gave them on the, on the pretest, we gave them a demographic, a, a little survey of attitudes and uh, demographic questions about who they were and what courses they had taken and everything like that. So, and we, of course, have their pretest score to measure as one measure of prior knowledge. And we asked them for their SAT or ACT score as another measure of prior knowledge. And we asked them about their attitude toward math. We asked them about their mother's education, which is a proxy for socioeconomic status. We asked them their college math classes, specifically which classes, their year in college. We asked them a whole bunch of other things and use these in our model. OK, same question for instructors. What do you think would make a difference for an instructor, a characteristic of an instructor that would create higher student achievement? Their attitude? Choice of text? Classroom management, how they ran it? Experience in teaching this course, years experience Teaching more generally? Oh, experience at the elementary. Yeah, good point. What else? Teaching load. Oh, we didn't think of that one. Did you say that, Amy? No. Oh, OK. OK, I better write teaching load as one that we didn't. All right, so here's what we did with uh, some of what we did with the instructors. Their experience, their rank, their highest degree. Instructional methods, I'm going to say more about that in a moment. Their attitude towards teaching the course. We also measured their attitudes towards mathematics, although I wasn't happy with the measure and it didn't really do very much. And their knowledge of math ed policy and standards documents. We measured all those things and more. And at the um, context level, the, the textbook, it turned out, was a contextual variable. The instructors didn't have much control over that. The, in general, the college or university told them what to use, with some exceptions. But um, so we kind of counted that as a, in, a contextual variable. It didn't matter because we put these in at the instructor level anyway. The class size, the school quality we thought was an important variable, like the average school average SAT or even the classroom average SAT or ACT as a measure of the school quality. We had other measures of school quality, but those were the two that seemed to function the best. So I want to talk about how we measured instructional method because it turns out to be important. We asked him this question. In your mathematics course, how often do your students engage in each of the following activities? So we had a one to four scale, never to every lesson. And keep in mind now, this is about what their students do. We're not asking them what they do. And th this is an example, a sample of the things we asked them. There were uh, actually 12 questions, but I didn't want to bore you with them. So explain the reasoning behind an idea. Work on problems for which there's no immediate method of solution. The next two were reverse coded, listen to you explain terms, definitions, or ideas, listen to you explain computational procedures, and finally analyze similarities and differences among several representations, et cetera. So we had 12 items like this, and we uh, did a statistical combining of them, a factor analysis kind of procedure, and came up with a single number for each teacher. And at the extremes, it would mean you always have students listening to you on one extreme, and at the other extreme, you always have students directly engaged with doing math during the class. So it's not so much about small groups, uh, grouping, as about what are the students doing. This one really surprised us. So then we made this model for the um, statistical geeks in the room. This is the model that we developed. It's a two-level model. Post-test is the outcome measure on this model. We did post-test, I mean, yeah, post-test is the measure here, <coughs> excuse me. We also ran models doing gain, and we got the same results. We ran a lot of different models once we had built the model and tested it. Then we ran it with different outcomes, and we got the same kinds of results every time. So, and at level two, we have the instructors, and it turned out the only variables that mattered were the pretest, 
and the um, combined ACT and SAT score for the students. We combined them on a, on a common scale so that we could use a single number. And at the instructor level, the textbook, the method, which was the stuff I just um, told you about, the, the item that I, items that I just described to you, and the mean pretest for the class, which was a measure of the classroom level. So those were the only, and we could substitute the mean CACT there. They both functioned about the same. So that gives you, you put those all together in one regression equation, essentially, is what you do when you do a hierarchical model. And we ran the model, and here's what we got. We explained 62% of the variance between instructors, which is enormous for this kind of work. And what we see here is that the mean post-test for all classes and all students was 56 plus points. That's that first number, that one. Um, then, of course, when you do a hierarchical model like this, it uses all these complicated techniques like Bayesian techniques and all. So this mean is a little bit different from the mean if you just add up the scores and divide by the number of students, because that was 57 plus. So the predicted mean for the, for the entire sample is that. Then if you add the textbook, and here's the way we did the textbook. We didn't have enough variation in 40, across 40 instructors. We could not measure individual textbooks. We just didn't have enough. So we put all the 13 textbooks that were written for these courses together against all the other instructors who didn't use a textbook or use some other book or used um, a combination of materials. So if you use one of those textbooks, it predicts a five plus point gain over people who don't use a textbook. That's astonishing. If you use one, one change in method from the mean up or down would result in a three point gain or loss. Um, these are all grand mean centered, so we're talking about a change from the, from the mean. The method meaning that, that, um, yes, this item here, and this was on a zero to four scale. So one thing to keep in mind is you don't get a one point change on that. You get a tenth of a point or a half a point. You don't get a one, you know, one point change would be enormous. So, oh, you know, most of the teachers were in a fairly small range on that variable. Um, and then the mean pretest accounted for a quarter point, and that's the mean pretest for the whole class. So, for every point on the mean pretest, remember it's a 50 with a 10 standard deviation. So, every point on the pretest would yield a quarter point on the post test. And then at the student related variables, the student pretest yielded a third of a point, so a point difference for a student yielded a third of a point difference on the um, post-test. And the CACT yielded another little better than a third of a point difference. Now again, keep in mind, there's nobody that fits yes on all of these places, so you're not going to get one on the text, one on the method, one on the, you know, so it's a model. It doesn't exactly fit anyone. But we did some more analysis. Does anybody have any questions about that before I go on? Yes. Yeah, the positive direction is students more engaged with the mathematics. <laughs> we had no idea how this was going to come out, and it surprised us too. We didn't know that it would be, that it would be anything, much less significant, and much less that, that big a um, coefficient. It was very, we were very surprised by that. The textbook too, we had no idea that was going to happen. Uh, the sample on which this is based is a thousand, a little over a thousand students, matched pre and post test. We had a lot more students in the sample, but we didn't have matched pre and post for everybody, so we couldn't use their data in this analysis. Anything else on this? Ta yeah, we, ran, we built the model adding variables in, and what I'm showing you is um, synthesized. It's only the variables that were significant. So we ran it in a lot of different ways. And you know, in almost every way we ran it, this is what was significant. We could substitute. Um, the CACT here, the class CACT, and that would give us the same result essentially. But other than that, um, no other variables ever showed up as significant, and these always did. Yes, sir. Instructor attitude. Instructor attitude. I, we didn't have a good measure of attitude, so I, don't, I think it might be significant, but I wasn't happy. Our measure just didn't hold up. And student attitude, likewise. We had a measure of it, but it didn't predict, and I think it was because the measure was bad. 
I mean, there's still a lot of variance that could be explained if the model were better. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that some of these are proxies for other things. Like, you can imagine the textbook is a proxy. Using one of those 13 textbooks could be a proxy for some other characteristic of classes that use the textbook. Um, I, I don't want to speculate about what it could be, but it doesn't mean that the textbook is causing this. This is correlational, but it could be some other unmeasured variable that's underlying and present in a lot of the classes that use one of the 13 textbooks. And the textbooks are so different from each other that it's hard to believe that this even happened. But Because, you know, using Sibylla's textbook is completely different from using some of the other ones. <laughs> Okay, I'm, yep, that's possible, that's a possibility. So it could be something about students' attitude towards the textbook, and I have some data about that. So we started looking at this and wondering, you know, we don't ever get, we get only two teachers, two instructors who really get way up there. And so nobody is really adding all these things together and coming up with a huge, uh, not very many of them are. So we started looking at the variables, trying to figure out how they related to each other. Yeah, it's still on a four-point scale. Yes, right. But, but the, the outcome is the effect size nonetheless. I mean, if you were to gain a point on the method, it would yield a three-point difference in the outcome, which is the effect size. A lot harder, exactly. Nobody gained, a, I mean, you know, it would be a lot, uh, you know, you don't see that. So um, what we learned here is student prior knowledge matters. So the more prior knowledge, the more post-test, and the more gain, not just post-test, but also gain it mattered for. And the use of a textbook designed for the course matters. One of the 13, using one of the 13 predicts a higher gain. And the method matters, the less instructor focused predicts a higher gain. The more student engagement predicts a higher gain. But it turned out that the textbook and the method were negatively correlated. So we started looking in more detail at that, and we ran some um, analyses. And here's, here's what we found. The pretest score by method for students with a low pretest score, which is 50 or below, or below 50, rather, compared to students with a high pretest score, above 50, the textbook was much more important for the high for the low pretest students than for the high pretest students. I'm sorry, this is the method. I'm, I'm, yeah, this is the method. The method was much more important for the low pretest students than for the high. Um, it was important for both of them, for both high pretest and low pretest students. The method would predict an increase in their outcome, but look at the difference in slopes here. The low pretest students were much, much more affected affected by the method than the high pretest students. Makes sense when you think about it, but we didn't know this was going to happen. Um, the low pretest students needed more engagement with the math to learn it. The high pretest students didn't need as much. And for the textbook, it's just the opposite. The high pretest students benefited much more from the textbook than the low pretest students did. Uh, so this is pretty interesting, I think, that you know, we have these contrary forces pulling, and if you've taught this course, you probably felt them, that the, the students who already are good math students and already know a lot need a, I don't want to say completely, but they need different things from the students who are struggling, who don't know enough to, to be elementary teachers yet. So we thought that was a pretty interesting outcome. Yes? Everybody improved, yeah. No, well, yeah, you're right. They needed them in different amounts or something. I don't know. How would you say that? It was more yeah. beneficial. Well, that, that no matter where they started, there is a kind of method that is more beneficial for students than for Yeah. They, they, they relied, I mean, my assumption is that they 
they rely on it. And they know how to use it, know how to use it, right? Which, I, you know, is one of the, when I've taught this course, that's one of the things I've tried to help them learn is how do you use a math textbook to learn? And a lot of the students don't know how to do that. There's a question back there. In the Yeah, so, so if we had a match between the textbook and the method, we might get an even better outcome. A more detailed breakdown. Yeah, a more detailed breakdown by, yeah, yeah. Amy? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So, you know, it's hard to understand exactly what it means because we actually we have data, video data from seven of these classes that we are writing, analyzing and writing about right now. But, but you know, the case studies, we can begin to explain some of this, but we can't really say for sure what accounts for it. But those are what the, that's what the data say. So we conclude that using a more student-focused method has a greater impact on low-scoring students and using one of the 13 textbooks has a greater impact on high scoring students, which I think is an a, a, a important outcome. Um, so what have we learned? What matters? Textbooks matter. Students' prior knowledge matters. Class average prior knowledge matters. And the teaching methods matter. But the textbooks and the methods matter different, for different students, matter more for different students. They matter differentially. Yeah, I guess that's a way to say it. And what have we learned about the courses? They're all in the math departments, almost 100% in, in my study. And in the CBMS study, it seems to support that. They're taught by mathematics faculty. Two courses is still the mean. We had a little bit over 2.2 or something. And some of the obvious instructor and contextual factors do not predict outcomes in this sample. Um, you know, there are a lot of caveats that I could give you that I won't go into unless you ask me. But there are a lot of caveats about these data. I'll, I'll say one, for example. We don't have any control over how seriously the students took these tests. Uh, we gave the, stu the instructors a script. We, uh, you know, in some cases, we went and did the script ourselves. In other cases, we couldn't. So we gave the instructors a script, and we told them the parameters of time and everything like that. But you know, we don't have any control over what happened. In fact, my favorite story is um, that we had a teacher in northern Michigan giving the test in um, late fall. I guess it was the post-test. And he called me up the next day and he said, you know, you're not going to be very happy with this, Raven. I said, what happened? He said, well, you know, we can't require students to take it because of IRB, so it's an optional test. And he said, so I told him it was optional and somebody raised his hand and said, what, what can we do if we don't want to take it? And he said, oh, you can leave. So everybody in the class got up and left. So we didn't have any post-test data from that class. <laughs> that was horrid. So um, what have we learned? Well, I would make the claim that these courses can have a big impact on future teachers' mathematical knowledge. And the factors that matter that I know about are ones that we can control. We can, teacher, instructors can use a textbook. They can use more student-oriented, student-engaging teaching methods. Um, and I want to make one important ob observation, and that is that most of the schools in this study, we only measured number and operations with the primary focus on fractions. So we don't have any data about other topics. But given that we were studying one course, they couldn't have learned a lot of these other topics. And most schools don't give them a chance to learn that other stuff. They, you know, they take the one course or the two courses, and they're done. And if the courses don't ever get around to probability and data, uh, or if they don't ever get around to geometry, that's just what happens. So, um, I mean, I think a big push on our part should be to have more math courses for these elementary teachers. Um, in other parts of the project, we've been comparing textbooks and analyzing these videotape lessons from our instructors. We have seven instructors on videotape teaching. Some, some of them we have the whole semester, and some we have fraction lessons. And um, I, I want to say that none of these classes reflect any standards or standardization, even teaching the same topic we see vast differences across 
all the instructors, and particularly the seven that we videotaped. There's no standardization about what should be included and who should, how it should be taught. And the textbooks don't help because they're all over the place too. There's, no, there's diversity of methods and a diversity of content. Um, and my personal conclusions that aren't really based on data directly, but what I've come to believe as a result of this study is we really, these courses need to focus on what I guess Deborah would call something particular. Um, right now they just, most of them go through the topics and that's fine, but you know, I think it's more effective when they, would be more effective if they focus on very particular things and engage students in doing those things. Um, and what I'm calling those things, the particular, is starting points for knowing elementary math and for learning to learn mathematics on their own because most of the math they're going to have to learn, they're going to have to learn on their own. We can't possibly teach them in three courses or in nine everything they need to know to teach the possibilities of K through eight mathematics. Um, I think the courses should use a K-6 a K curriculum integrally in the work of the courses. There's one textbook that does that. Tom Parker's book uses the Singapore materials integrally. Of course, none of the teachers that he's teaching are going to teach with the Singapore materials. So it's a wonderful idea that perhaps doesn't have the impact that it could have if they were using everyday math or some curriculum that many, many teachers would be teaching with, integral to the, to the um, learning of mathematics. And I think using children's common misunderstandings would also be an important source of something particular. We had one teacher in our sample, in our group of seven that we videotaped, who's a CGI teacher. Do you know what CGI is? Um, and he, he was, he's CGI trained, and now he's teaching. CGI is, a, is cognitively guided instruction. It's out of Wisconsin. It's a year, many, many years uh, research project where they taught teachers to pay attention to student thinking. They didn't teach them how to teach. They taught them how to pay attention to student thinking. And they taught them particular things about student thinking, common errors to look for, common misunderstandings. And this guy had applied this to teaching math to undergraduate students, future teachers. And he had a repertoire of problems that he used with his teachers. And he knew exactly what they were going to do in response to these problems. He taught the course quite a few times. And so he used CGI thinking. I don't guess they're CGI methods, but CGI thinking to teach this course based on young students' misconceptions and his own undergraduate students' misconceptions. And it was just stunning to watch him teach this course, really, truly stunning. So those are my personal conclusions. And I think that's it, and I'd be happy. We have a little bit of time for questions before Teresa takes over. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, Sibylla's place just lost two of their three. The state can needs to reply. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, at, at Georgia, they've added requirement for the teachers to take phys ed, right, and art? Well, they could have cut art and phys ed, but they cut math. And so... <laughs> That's good, yeah. And, you know, I mean, where we're heading, I heard somebody talking about this earlier, we need specialists in elementary school to teach some of these subjects that require so much. I mean, we, our expectations for the children are so high now. That exactly, yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. 
structure, yeah. Well, Yeah, you know, the, the teacher that I just mentioned, his courses were twice a week for an hour and a half each. So, yes. No, there, that's not counted. Um, the, it, it's counted in the circumstance where the only requirement is some general distribution requirement that might be satisfied by college algebra. But I don't think we actually saw that. I think when, the schools that had a more general distribution requirement, it was a, at a higher level than that. But if that's all they required, we might, that might have showed up. I don't think that happened, though. Yes? In the 50 minute, yeah. That I had, we could watch it, but then we couldn't have meaningful conversations about yeah. it. Yeah. So moving direction in school. Yeah. That's really important. Did somebody there? Yes. Yep. Not percent. Yeah. Let me get back to it. So the, the, um, the equation predicts the post-test. So um, if you, the, the mean score for all students with no textbook, uh, one on method, no, a zero on method, so that's the mean. A mean method was, is, is zero. And a mean pretest of zero. And a mean pretest for the student of zero. And a mean CACT of zero. So we grand mean centered all those variables. So if all of those fell out, then the average score would be 56.22. If a student had average everywhere else and was in a class that used a textbook, you would expect the score to be 61, well, 62 points. Remember, I mean, yeah, 62 points. Remember, the mean is 50 and the standard deviation is 10. So that would be two points above the standard deviation. So that would be a huge gain. Okay? No. Yeah, the mean post-test score. No, no, the, pre -t the mean pre-test score is 50, I'm sorry. The mean pre-test score is 50, and we've grand mean centered it here, so the mean pre goes in here as zero, and adding and subtracting on that. Yes, no, it's zero. It's zero. No, it's not a, it's a d discrete variable, so it's centered on 0.5. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that, but that's what it means. You get almost six points for having a textbook. So if you, if you have a textbook and everything else is even, the predicted score would be 62. Everything else won't be even, but... Let's see, there were about um, 25 questions on the test. But they are not scored equally, so it's hard to say exactly. A couple of more questions. Yeah, a couple more questions probably. Yeah. Zell? Yeah, when did you between large universities, um, large state universities and colleges? I assume you had both in your both. No. Um, that didn't seem to matter. I mean, and part of that is we had different um, uh, selectivity and quality in both areas. We had better and worse large schools and better and worse private and small schools. So, you know, there was enough variation in other ways that that particular variable didn't matter. And we had graduate students teaching at some of the large schools, so, you know, there are all kinds of things that play into it. Yeah. The, yeah. And then we have to stop, huh? No, just one of the 13, 
published textbooks published by a publisher. Um, we did. We interviewed some of the instructors. And, you know, the reasons, and in fact, the reasons why a lot of these, um, yeah, let's get that out of there, why a lot of these textbooks got written is because the instructors were not happy with the available textbooks. Ask Sibylla. Mm -hmm. And Tom Parker, same thing. So we talked to the uh, authors of the textbooks about why they wrote textbooks, and we talked to the instructors about why they chose the textbooks they chose or didn't. And there were a lot of reasons. Sometimes the, the college mandated some other textbook. So, you know, is that, is that enough? Okay. okay well, let's thank Raven again. I'm on. Yes, can you hear me? Good. Uh, hello. Oh, I forgot my notes. Thank you, Dios. Well, I want to thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you. This is a real treat uh, for me. I love the space and I love the presentations. Um, I wanted to um, uh, re uh, give you the uh, Sharon Sanks regrets. Uh, she is not able to join us uh, today. Um, I heard that she had been dancing in the NCTM uh, salsa. Uh, and you know how she dances, so uh, she hurt her knee. So, <laughs> so she's, uh, she's in therapy, and uh, anyway, so my, my dear friend and partner in crime is not here, so I'm going to have to present this myself. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I am not a mathematician or a mathematics educator. Uh, I have spent my 20, 25 years since I arrived to MSU, close to 25 years, uh, doing research on mathematics, uh, teacher education, and uh, a little bit on reading, but now that has just, I'm forgetting about that, and completely dedicated myself to doing this. I'm a policy um, researcher, and I do big projects. Um, so, and, um, so that's how I came to this study that I'm going to present to you. Um, I wanted to say something about the presentation uh, that Sibila made this morning, and it's really interesting because um, about a week ago I was at the Comparative International Education Society meeting. I'm, a, I'm the past president, and I was giving the presidential address. And one of the topics in my presidential address was precisely what you were saying, um, but talking about large-scale studies. Uh, usually people, I'm not sure that people understand fully what it means for the, in this case, for the teacher education community to engage in a project like this. And so part of my address was about that, you know, to try to uh, take back, uh, you know, what we need to take back as teacher educators, precisely what you were saying, you know, how do we take this back? Uh, so this study, um, uh, it's a study that invites um, states or big regions to participate in studying, um, in this case, teacher education, the, the, the mathematics education of future teachers. How do we do that? Well, we did that uh, with IEA, which is the uh, sponsoring institution for teams. So this is, you know, with big institutional support. But really, uh, we began the study in uh, 2003 with a very modest grant from NSF uh, to try to do a, what they call a, a, a test of concept study. So first we did a, a little study with six countries and began kind of building the whole idea that this could be done. People said we will never be able to do this study. Uh, then, uh, after that, we started talking to teacher educators. The study depended on teacher educators working in their institutions, collecting the data from their future teachers. So at the end, you know, what happened with this IES study is that uh, you cre uh, the study creates a legitimate space for the state, the state, for, you know, government institutions um, and, and, and teacher educators to actually create legitimate knowledge to inform policy. In other words, in this case, in this the teacher education study, is the teacher educators who carry out the study, who collected the data from their future teachers, who are speaking to the reformers and to people, you know, who otherwise would be taking control. Uh, you know, teacher educators are talking about what matters. We are providing the evidence. So uh, I like to 
you know, as I present this, uh, you know, please in, uh, ask questions and all that, but I'd like you to think about how this can happen. You know, this is, this is a study that, um, for the first time, a bunch of countries and teacher educators in these countries decided that we needed to understand what were the effects of teacher education programs on the mathematics preparation of teachers before they became teachers. It's a very powerful study, and it's even more powerful because it's international. So it's not only uh, the U.S. participated, of course, so it's not only the U.S. You know, researchers participating, but it's a representative sample of the United States you know, collecting that data and then saying this is what we need in teacher education. It's quite powerful. It was very difficult to um, put the study together. It, it was a lot of work and a lot of effort, but at the end it happened. Now, if I had had my dream come true in this study, I will have a study every single state in the United States. The way it was done, we got a representative sample of the whole United States. I don't like that as much. It's nice, but even better will have been to incorporate you know, each state studying their teacher education institutions, a representative sample of states. So let me talk to you a little bit about this so that you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. And, and you know, feel free to, to ask questions. Um, so, um, by the way, I, of course, the study is huge. So if you need to know, you want to know more about the study, you can go to our website or you can just go to Google and, and type TEDS uh, M, MSU, and it will get you there. And you can also, by the way, see um, the United States study, which was um, coordinated by Bill Schmidt. Uh, he has also his own uh, little report in there. Uh, the study was uh, possible thanks to a grant, very generous grant from the National Science Foundation. The participating countries and their institutions, the IEA, and of course, uh, support on item development and expert judgment came from several of you here. So it was a really, a real collaborative project. Uh, there are many people to recognize in this study from MSU, from all over the world. We work with the Australian Council for Educational Research, the International Association for the Evaluation of Educational Achievement, of course. They have a data processing center in Hamburg, and our sample was developed by the Sampling Referee in Statistics Canada. This is our group. Um, we are relaxing here in one of our many, many meetings in Taiwan, uh, or Chinese Taipei, as uh, we now have to call it. Um, the little girl there is not a mathematics educator or a teacher educator, but uh, all the rest are all, uh, you know, mathematics uh, and teacher educators from all the countries participating. The main questions in the study had to do with the policies that support prospective primary and secondary teachers achieve level of mathematics and related teacher knowledge. So we wanted to know the big context. It's almost like an HLM uh, model, con uh, you know, uh, embedded context. Um, what are the learning opportunities available to them via their teacher education programs? So we actually went into the teacher education programs and look at the syllabi and and a bunch of other things. Uh, and then we also wanted to know the level and depth of the mathematics and related teaching knowledge attained by prospective teachers. And this study covered primary and secondary future teachers at the end of their preservative teacher education. We wanted to measure, uh, have a pre and post, but we couldn't do that because the beginning of teacher education varies so much across all the countries, it was impossible to do. Um, and of course, we have the comparative question how all these questions compare across the countries we study. We uh, developed four surveys. We surveyed the teacher education programs, the teacher educators, the primary future teachers, the secondary future teachers. And uh, today I'm going to talk mostly about the data we collected from the future teachers. And uh, of course, we collected background, opportunities to learn, beliefs, and the assessments and the, um, on, uh, the assessments were on, mat on uh, mathematics content and mathematics pedagogical uh, content. Um, I, I should tell you that at the beginning, when we were trying to figure out, um, you know, the formal study began in 2005. And, um, you know, we, before that we did, uh, you know, the little pilot study, then we did a lot of item pilot, then an instrument pilot, and so on and so forth. When we were in the stage of the item pilot, we were reporting the results to all the people who had participated. The countries themselves said, you know, we would like you to develop a test. 
what is the point of asking these future teachers all these questions if we're going to call this a test? Let's do a test. Okay, well, great. Sounds great. So we started doing that, and you know, we, it was a very steep curve, but we were able to develop the uh, test. And I will talk a little bit about that soon. Uh, these are the countries that participated in the study. Now, with IE studies, we really do not uh, you know, select the countries. Basically, we invite the countries. So anyone who wants to come and do the study is welcome to do this. And that's why you know, people are, say, those are very different countries. But what's your criteria to select the countries? We didn't. They selected themselves. And so what we have then, but this is interesting too, this is the Human Development Index, one of many indices, but I kind of like this one. And you can see that a lot of the countries that selected themselves to do the study of teacher education are highly developed countries. Um, and then, you know, we have medium human development countries. They call it Thailand, Georgia, Philippines, and Botswana. So poorer countries. But uh, it almost, uh, this almost tells me that people who are doing well, I guess, or perceive themselves as doing well in their teacher education, then go ahead and feel that they can participate in this study. Uh, so only Botswana, uh, uh, you know, an African country, and only Chile from Latin America. Okay, so we collected data from uh, more than 15,000 primary future teachers, uh, 9,000 secondary future teachers, a little bit more, 500 institutions, um, uh, 40, 451 were preparing future primary teachers, 339 were preparing future secondary teachers, and uh, almost close to 5,000 teacher educators. So, um, the way I'm going to present this is I'm going to give you a little bit of an advance on the final report that we're uh, working on. Actually, we finished the final report, and right now it's in the hands of the IEA, Publications Committee. Uh, the IEA has uh, extremely high standards. So when the report comes out, you know, we can defend it against anyone, but it takes a long time to get it ready. So we have been thinking that this is, was going to come out last year. We are still in the process of checking all the tables and all the numbers and all the dots and um, but what we have found is that, of, of course, teacher education varies across countries and within countries. Uh, even when we say we're going to study primary and secondary teachers, uh, the definition of primary and secondary varied across the countries. So some, it was difficult to say when primary ended and secondary began. Uh, this is an example of a very simple uh, system of teacher education in Chinese Taipei. And basically what you have on top is the grade span for which teachers are prepared. Uh, the line on top is uh, for the uh, grade span for secondary teachers. I'm sorry, it doesn't show very well. And the lower one is for elementary uh, teachers. So basically, they have elementary education for teachers up to grade 6, and then the secondary teachers teach grades 7 to 12. Um, the program duration is the same for primary and secondary, and of course, they train many more elementary teachers than secondary teachers. That's the lower graph. Now, Switzerland is, a very, is an example of a very complicated teacher education system. They basically train primary teachers for, to teach four different types of grades. So there is one program that trains teachers from grade, to teach grade one to two or three, another one grades one to six, another one three to six, and then the secondary school teachers. So very differentiated uh, system of teacher education. Um, the length of the training is shorter for the primary teachers in general, three years, and it's longer for secondary school. And this is very interesting, you know, I want you to remember this because, uh, you know, these two countries that I'm showing to you are the highest achieving, some of the highest, two of the highest achieving countries. So in Chinese Taipei, in three years, they do wonders in training the primary teachers. Um, and then, uh, as in the other uh, country, they train a large number of teachers uh, to teach grades one to six and less in the other grades. Because the differences in how the teacher education systems uh, are, you know, the nature of teacher education systems across, across the countries, uh, one of the big problems in comparative studies is how do you compare 
And we couldn't just say, okay, we're going to put all the primary teachers in this clump, and we're going to compare them, and then all the secondary teachers in this clump. We have to figure out how to make sense of the system. So at the end, we had four groups for, fri for primary um, uh, programs, and then two groups for secondary programs. And you're going to see those groups reflected in the uh, results I'm going to show you. So um, next are the highlights from the analysis of future mathematics and pedagogical knowledge uh, tests. Um, and I wanted to just give you an advanced organizer, you know, what, what we found in general. Uh, we found, of course, there is a wide variation in the attained knowledge of mathematics that people uh, have uh, at the point in which they are going to graduate from their teacher preparation programs. Um, the difference in mean in mathematics, mathematics content knowledge and mathematics pedagogical content knowledge scores between the highest and lowest achieving country in each program group was between one and two standard deviations. In the highest achieving countries within each program group, the majority of future teachers had scores at or above the higher mathematical content knowledge anchor point. And I'm going to explain what the anchor points are. And then um, I want you to, to maybe write down this this countries because they are the highest achieving. So when you're looking at the graphs, the graphs have all of the countries, but pay particular attention to Chinese Taipei for primary. The Russian Federation, Singapore, Switzerland, and Norway, they were the highest uh, scoring countries in terms of you know, the, the knowledge that the future teachers have in mathematics. And then in secondary, Chinese Taipei, again, Russian Federation, and Singapore. So what, what was our assessment like? So we measure, um, basically, because this is an IE study, we decided to measure the same domains, content domains as Teams does. So we included numbers and operations, geometry and measurement, algebra and functions, data and chance. We also um, measure cognitive domains, knowing, applying, and reasoning, and also curricular level. In other words, school mathematics and university mathematics uh, knowledge. And for the assessment of mathematical pedagogical content knowledge, we also had the same content domains. Uh, but for pedagogical domains, we had measurement on curricular knowledge, planning, and enacting. So this is the, uh, as technical as I'm going to get, but basically to tell you that um, we had, a, uh, you know, in the design of the future primary teacher assessment, <coughs> We had 70 questions distributed ac across five blocks. What this basically means, <coughs> do I have a water? Thank you. Yep. Um, <coughs> we only had 60 minutes total. That's what the programs gave us. Okay, you want to measure the teachers? You have uh, 60 minutes for your test plus half an hour for everything else you want to ask. That was really hard. So what, what we had to do is we wanted to cover um, what, you know, the domain as much as we could in these areas. So uh, we developed the test in five blocks. So this is equivalent of a, an individual. If they had taken the whole test, they would have spent five hours answering the test for the primary group. And really, the length of the text, test um, and the number of blocks uh, also depend on the number of teachers that we have. So there are significantly less future secondary teachers to measure than primary teachers. Basically, all the primary teachers came into the sample, but only secondary teachers, in other words, specialists, came into the sample. And the questions were of different types, multiple choice, complex multiple choice, and constructed response. Um, we had separate scales for mathematics content knowledge and mathematics pedagogical content knowledge uh, for both primary and secondary. The IRTS scores uh, scale, were scaled to have an international mean of 500, like we do in teams, and a standard deviation of 100. Um, uh, basically, the report will have uh, descriptive statistics and distributions reported by program group and country. So right now, we're not doing any correlational uh, you know, analysis. And then we developed something that we call anchor points which were used to give conceptual meaning to selected mathematics content knowledge and mathematical pedagogical thank you, uh, scores. Um, so what are anchor points? And uh, I'm going to describe the anchor points here in more detail, because I think this relates to the concern that this meeting has. 
uh, the whole idea of the content standards and how um, can we tell whether people are achieving and what does it mean anyways? You know, if you have, um, you know, a score of 500 in the test, what does it mean? You know, what do you know? How do we think about this? Or if you have a score of 300. So we decided with uh, Marjorie Case at Michigan State University, who is a, he's a, he's a um, IRT person, psychometrician, uh, we decided to try to figure out how to do this because it's not like the IA studies. You know, in IA you have a huge population of students, huge. So you basically can say, okay, I'm going to divide the population in these points and I'm going to see how these points, you know, how, how people look when they get to this point. We couldn't do that. Uh, we had to kind of actually, maybe inductively, um, define the anchor points by the way in which people um, answer or distributed themselves in the uh, in, in their answers in the test. So at the end, I'm going to only describe the mathematical content knowledge anchor points. Uh, we had two anchor points for that test, um, and they, they were determined by the distribution of items along a theta scale. Uh, we also had content experts uh, who came, and we said, here, this is what, these are the items that people at anchor point answer correctly, and these are the items that people at the anchor point to answer correctly. Can you tell us, you know, what this says to you in terms of their knowledge? And so I think this is probably the most relevant part for this, for this meeting. The ex except, from, except from lower anchor point descriptions, this is for the primary mathematical content knowledge. Uh, these are the people who score at the lowest anchor point. Not, not by any means, it's not the lowest point in the scale, but the lowest anchor point. So we had two anchor points. And so the mean, remember, we centered the mean at 500. So these people are below that mean. And that's what they were able to you know, answer correctly uh, over there. Basic computations with whole numbers and simple problem solving situations, understanding properties of operations, solving some problems with fractions, and solving problems involving simple expressions and equations. But I think most interesting is to see what they, they had difficulty with. Solving abstract problems and those requiring multiple steps, understanding the number line and the infinity of numbers between any two real numbers, knowledge of proportionality and, and multiplicative reasoning, and re reasoning about multiple statements and relationships among several mathematical concepts. So that's the anchor point one. And this is, um, people in the anchor point too. So now they are above the 500 mean. And so they were able to answer correctly all the previous items that anchor point people answer correctly. Plus, they were able to use fractions to solve story problems. They knew how to find the least common multiples of the numbers in a familiar context and determine areas and perimeters of simple figures. But they have difficulty solving problems involving proportional reasoning or percentages, reasoning about factors and multiples, solving problems about area, involving coordinate geometry, and recognizing applications of quadratic or exponential fun functions and algebraic reasoning. So this is the primary level. So I'm just going to show you two more uh, on the secondary. So this is the, the secondary anchor point uh, one. So they are below the mean, 490. And I'm going to just let you read, uh, likely to answer correctly and have difficulty with. Should we move to the next one? So secondary anchor point two. So these are 59 points above the 500 mean. And I'm going to let you read it again.
done. So does this resonate uh, with you, with your experience about, you know, some issues that your students may have? Yes. Oh, okay, I, I should tell you a little bit more about the test. So um, these items were developed by the countries that participated in the project. So they are, you know, items that people said, these are items that make sense to us, you know, based on their curriculum and all that. Um, the IA has very uh, strict requirements about language and all that. So yes, there, is a, uh, there was a, the whole translation and all that was perfectly done. It took us months to do this. So uh, every country had their, um, had the test in their official language. So we do have a question in the questionnaire where we ask the person who answered the, the test whether this was their native language. And for some of them, it wasn't. Some of them uh, didn't seem to matter much because they still score really high. Uh, so that's an, an, a very good question. We are going to have in, the, um, in our website uh, something that we call the technical report. And we're going to describe every single step of everything that we did. But all of these you know, are, are very good questions as to you know, how was the, te the test constructed. And you know, we did a lot of piloting. We threw away lots of items, brought new items, te retested the items. Um, you know, I, I just think that this is a very good effort in terms of you know, the, the, the kinds of things that these countries wanted to do, which was to have a way to understand how well the programs are doing based on the knowledge that, uh, that you know, they expect their future teachers to have for mathematics and mathematics pedagogy. Yes, and the rubrics, uh, we had many, many training sessions uh, of uh, people, you know, who came to, uh, to score uh, the rubrics. So we had, uh, you know, manuals and manuals and manuals, the, uh, you know, training sessions. Uh, we tested reliability. They, uh, they did several runs. They sent the, the reliability coefficients to us. We made sure that uh, they were good before, uh, you know, they, we started the final scoring run. So we have all that documented as well. Good questions, very good questions. So, okay, so here are, do, can you see this? No. This is so bad. Okay, can you see the, the bars? Yeah. Okay, so the bars is pretty much what, what you need to see. So basically what, the line that you have, you know, bef the line, the uh, vertical line before 500, that's anchor point one. And then the second line is anchor point two. And, uh, you know, you see that uh, some countries, the bars are way over to the right. Uh, basically, what you want to find, if you can see it, is um, the black, maybe look like a dot, the black dot in the middle of the bar. Yeah, if the black dot in the middle of the bar, you know, is out there, you know, past anchor point two, that means that most of the people in that, uh, in that test, you know, score really high. So they, uh, let me see. So in, what basically you have there, I don't know why this doesn't show very well. I thought it would, is there a way to turn off down the light? This guy is not there. No, okay. So uh, this will be available soon, I hope, when the reports are published. But basically what you have is the program groups, group one, two, three, and four for primary. So lower primary to grade four maximum, primary to grade six maximum, primary secondary combined, and then the last row is for mathematics specialists. And you can see in the last row, mathematics specialists from Poland and Singapore did very well in this test. They are way beyond the anchor point two with means of 600 and 500 and 600 and 514, I think. No, 500 and 528. And then above, uh, the, basically the Russian Federation does well, as well as Chinese Taipei. It's almost all the students are above po up anchor point two, and uh, Singapore as well. And Switzerland does very well as well. Now the US, uh, for, this is for primary grade six, the mean was 518. Compared to in the same group, 
I'm going to read from here. Compared with Chinese Taipei in the same group, their mean is 623. It's unbelievable. In three years. So, um, and in the lower group for mathematics specialists, the U.S. is also there, and they have a mean of 520, compared with Poland, you know, with Singapore, 600, and with Poland, 614, meaning the test. Yep. Is this all the countries, or is this a selection of the I don't understand. These are all the countries, but group by the four primary groups. So that's why you see countries repeated. For example, Poland is in the first group because they have a program that trains teachers only to grade four maximum. Now, that program is actually very different. They didn't do very well in the test. They had a mean of 556, 456. But you see Poland again in the, in the mathematics specialist group. Actually, this is, they, are, they, they are looking to do this for a reform. They want to train only mathematics specialists. But you can see in the, in the mathematics specialist group, Poland, the people the, had a mean of 614. So it's a really crucial difference. Even within the same country, the achievement of these future teachers is quite different based on the program and the curriculum that they have. So this is the primary group. I can let you see a little bit more if you want to. This is the secondary group. Maybe this is a little bit, I don't know why this looks so bad. This is the first time that this looks so bad. Maybe it's just a different, I don't know what it is. Um, okay, so in the secondary group, uh, you know what is very interesting here is that the lower secondary to grade 10 maximum, that's what you would think of as middle school. People didn't do very well in general there. You know, some of them went, you know, beyond anchor point two, but for example, the U.S. didn't. The U.S. had a mean of 468, so they didn't even reach the 500 level uh, mean. And the highest mean there uh, was for Singapore of 544, I mean, of 444, and then Switzerland 531, and then Poland 529. In the lower group, though, I mean, this is kind of nicer. Uh, we can see that lower and upper secondary future teachers do get more preparation in mathematical uh, content knowledge. A lot of them are uh, beyond anchor point one, and some of them are you know, beyond anchor point two. Of course, the Russian Federation did really well here, as well as Chinese Taipei. Uh, the US had a mean of 553. Um, you know, but the interesting thing is to compare the U.S. achievement with uh, the achievement of, for example, Chinese Taipei, 553 and 667, um, and 594 for the Russian Federation. It's really interesting. So, but what we have too, so I'm going to just move on. Uh, the other thing that we did is that we asked uh, a lot of questions about opportunity to learn. You know, what is what is happening in the programs? that, you know, causes, maybe causes this, these results. Uh, so a summary of the, of the results and opportunity to learn is that the concentration of primary level OTL on the basics of, uh, is basically, primary level OTL is concentrated in numbers and measurement across all countries. That's uh, pretty um, uh, constant. Uh, and there is a concentration of university level opportunity to learn with the exception of statistics, mostly in programs that prepare upper secondary school teachers. Um, there are opportunities to learn pedagogy and field experiences, um, and they are available, but the duration and, and quality varies. Uh, this is what we measure in terms of opportunity to learn, and the descriptions are basically here. But uh, basically, we ask people to tell us whether they had a study or not these topics, and we define the topics. And we have a kind of triangulation with the questions that we ask the institutions and the questions that we ask the teacher educators and some syllabus uh, analysis of the syllabi, which I wanted to show you but decided not to because it's just too much information. Um, okay, so this, these are basically the questions that we ask. And so what, what is interesting here, these are just uh, proportions, you know, the percentage reporting whether they have or have not uh, studied something 
study at, uh, the topics. So, um, and is the, is the average. So, the interesting thing is to see, you know, who reports having study numbers, measurement, and geometry. And I kind of cir circle the Russian Federation, Switzerland, and Chinese Taipei. This, however, uh, doesn't give you a full view because sometimes, um, sometimes what is surprising is even though the Chinese Taipei people say that they have studied this, um, actually the emphasis that they have in the program is not as much on, 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 on what you will see. Well, it's more in the school curriculum that they are going to teach because they have already learned numbers, measurement, and geometry in secondary school and high school. So they don't reteach it like we do sometimes here in the States. So they actually are studying how to teach numbers, measure, and geometry when they become uh, teachers. This is another one, functions, data representation, calculus, and validation and abstracting. You can see how low the numbers are in validation and abstracting and calculus uh, in some data representation as well. And so there is more variability definitely in these topics than in the previous topics. This is uh, another one, but this is for secondary future teachers. The numbers are higher for secondary future teachers in terms of studying functions, data representation, calculus, and so on. Um, and here's the other one for, for secondary teachers. Again, statistics is variable, probability is variable, but they study more calculus, analytic geometry, and linear algebra. Okay. Almost done here. I wanted to show you this, and this is just a short example of the many things that we have. But we ask the institutions to tell us, you know, how do they make sure that, you know, people um, had, the had a, achieved the requirements to graduate. And what you can see here is that in the, the yes, the dots, dark dots is yes. So you can see that, uh, you know, it's very standard for all the countries to say, well, they have to pass, um, have a passing grade on all subjects, have a passing grade on a field experience, but, and a level of teacher competence in the classroom. But then what really is, stands out is that in Switzerland, Chinese Taipei, um, and in other high achieving countries, basically everybody has to pass a comprehensive written examination and a comprehensive oral examination except Singapore, well, Singapore, they do other things. They have a combined program. That's Singapore, if I had more time, I would tell you about the special case, but yes. Um, national examinations, the US is doing that. Um, an examination set by the programs as well. And in some places, they have to write and defend a thesis. This is, you know, a lot of requirements in terms of what people have to do in order to graduate and become a teacher. So that's, that's that. Uh, this is uh, just the index of, of our international report, uh, which should come out soon. And of course, uh, I have promised that I will send it to the institute so that they can put it on the website and all that. We will publish this uh, and publicize this everywhere. Um, we have also available right now on our website a conceptual framework. Somebody was asking, you know, uh, about the cost and salary study of teaching. You were asking about that, Sal. How do we encourage people who know a lot of mathematics to become teachers? Uh, there are some answers in that uh, report. The cost and salary study done by Martin Carnoy, done Stanford. Um, he did a comparison uh, of different countries in terms of what they offer people who know a lot of mathematics and in the different professions where they go, including teaching. And last but not least, um, since TED is finishing, one of the things we wanted to do, and of course the question that everybody answers is, okay, so now you know what future teachers know, but what happens when they move into schools? So uh, we're starting the first math study. Uh, NSF has again gave us a seed, little seed grant uh, to, um, to kind of explore whether this is possible. And what we want to do is we want to figure out whether we can find uh, ma mathematics teachers, uh, uh, beginning teachers in the first five years of teaching mathematics uh, across countries and just ask all kinds of questions including also observations and all that. But we wa basically want to know about transitions from pre-service to in-service and then the support uh, and the learning that happens as they are, you know, in their first five years of teaching mathematics. And um, that's it. Thank you.
we have like five minutes per question, for questions. Uh, uh, five minutes. Yes. Whom? Whom? I'm sorry. In Chinese Taipei, you oh. said that the students came in with better knowledge of mathematics, so you don't have to reteach them something. But, but that's obviously something else that the students predict. Is, uh, is there some, some other thing that is important within the program? Yes, we have uh, you know, a, a lot of description about that. The, the, the kind of curriculum that they use in mathematics, mathematics pedagogy, pedagogy, uh, they, it's very complementary. And, and it is very intensive what they do. You know? So the, they do learn, while they are in their university preparation, they learn mathematics. They are almost, I think, uh, mathematics majors, I think you can, you can say. Uh, but they also learn you know, how to teach the curriculum, the school curriculum, they also learn a lot more mathematics, kind of deeper mathematics that will take for them to teach that school curriculum well. Uh, so they definitely do a lot of work with their, with their future teachers. And they have just reduced the, the year of their um, field experience. There was a year, now they are only you know, doing it for half a year. And the thing is that they have such a surplus of uh, teachers that they, you know, they cannot hire all these teachers. So one wonders, you know, that's part of the other story, you know. So you, you train all these teachers, but only 5% go into the teaching force. Where are the others? Yeah, so what, what are the teacher education programs really training these people for? So to me, it's really puzzling. But that's an interesting question. Yes. Right, yeah, so they, I don't know what happens when they go out. Uh, the only thing that we know right now is that, uh, you know, these programs really very consistently do a very good job. They have a centralized system. They have a centralized curriculum. They are getting a lot of the privatization situation also. There are smaller teacher education programs that are popping up everywhere. Um, you know, teacher education is a big business. So, <laughs> thank you.